So today, uh, we're going to be finishing a series about words that make us cringe. And uh, we looked at the S word, sin. We looked at the F word, forgiveness. And today is the P word, perseverance. Today, I wanted to start just with a word of prayer because it's hot. We know it's hot. Uh, but you know, still, if that's the biggest thing we got to overcome today, uh, compared to other churches that are meeting throughout the world, that's really not that much. So let's have a word of prayer together. God, I would just pray that over the next 20 minutes or so, you would be able to uh, supernaturally help us stay in tune with your word. As we think about perseverance, about spiritual momentum, there's some of us in this room who need to hear it because maybe we're real close to kind of checking out. For others of us, God, there might be a hurdle or obstacle right around the corner, uh, and we need to persevere through it. So God, speak to each of our hearts individually. Uh, remove me out of the way, and may your word speak boldly. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In your uh, order of worship, your worship bulletin, there's a page in there, and if you wanted to fill in some blanks, you could do that to kind of have some notes to take home. Uh, but I wanted to start with you to think about and actually, say it to the person next to you. Answer this question. If you could have been around for one event in Jesus' life, what event would you have loved to have been around? Turn to the person next to you and tell them what it would have been. Now, I'm guessing some of you might have said, oh, I would have loved to have been there. That night in Bethlehem, that starry, magical night when Jesus was born, when God became flesh. Others of you might have said, you know, I would have loved to have been on that boat and to look across the water and to see Jesus walking on water, defying the very laws of nature. That's when I would have wanted to tag along. Others of you might have said, uh, you know, early that Sunday morning, I would have loved to have been there and been at the tomb to see Jesus who is on the cross, who has died, has resurrected. Maybe that's where some of you would have wanted to tag along. And I won't ask for a show of hands, but some of you wanted to be there when Jesus turned the water to wine. Maybe that's when you wanted to tag along. Well, if I had a choice, if I had to say, I would have loved to have been there the day that Peter, James, and John journeyed up a mountain, and right there in front of them, Jesus was transfigured. I want you to hear the story out of the Gospel of Matthew Chapter 17, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. When he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. What an amazing event. Now that word transformation, transfigured, literally means metamorphosis. It's as if in those moments... God, who is in the flesh of Jesus, just seemed to overflow out as Jesus' face turned white and his, his clothes became so bright. And if that isn't a spiritual high enough, right at that moment, there's Elijah and Moses with him and talking with him. And if that isn't spiritually high enough, then a voice from heaven, God's voice, says, this is my son, listen to him. And right in those moments, Peter, who was always kind of known for always wanting something to say, in all of his profound eloquence says, it's good to be here. Yeah, no kidding, Peter. I mean, are you seeing what's happening right in front of you? It's good to be here. And then Peter says, let's just stay right here. Have you ever had a spiritual moment? Maybe in a retreat, a mission trip, maybe in a worship service, a personal Bible study, an experience where you just felt so close to God, where you kind of said to yourself, it is good to be here. It was as if your spiritual life was firing on all cylinders. Everything just aligned so well, and you just said, I feel God. I, I am experiencing God. I want to stay right here. 
Well, the truth of the matter is that our Christian lives aren't lived out on the mountaintop. They're lived down in the valley where there's jobs and school and stress and pressures. And when Peter says to Jesus, let's stay right here, it's as if Jesus just ignores the statement because the next verses say they just began to come down the hill. Today, I want us to look at this passage in Hebrews, which is going to give us five things we need to do to persevere, to have spiritual momentum that when we are in the midst of life, we can continue to be growing strong in our relationship with Christ. And we find those verses in the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter. And here's what it says, five things that we can do. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now you need to know, I... A little bit of a confession. I spent a lot of time at racetracks. Not the type that could get a pastor in trouble, but at track and field events. Uh, both of my sons uh, ran track throughout their high school careers, indoor track, outdoor track, cross country. Brent was a phenomenal runner. But it was interesting to watch my sons because their strategy and how they ran these races was vastly different. Brent is a sprinter when he runs an indoor-outdoor sprint of 55 meters, 100 meters, something like that. When the gun goes off, he gives it his all. He runs as fast and as hard as he can. But in the fall, when he runs with the cross-country team, his strategy is a little bit different because he's running multiple miles. And so he can't just give it all out as soon as the gun goes off. He starts off at a pretty fast pace, but in that last 100 to 200 yards, he turns on the afterburners, runs fast, and finishes extremely strong. Well, the passage I just read in Hebrews seems to indicate that our Christian life, it's not a sprint. It's more of a marathon. It looks more like a cross-country meet. And so we have to pace ourselves. We have to have perseverance and momentum to know that as we run, there's going to be some hurdles, some struggles, some obstacles that may be in the way. And so the first thing that that passage tells us to do is we need to find strength from those who've gone before. The writer says this, Therefore we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now in order to have the context, if you go back one chapter to chapter 11 of Hebrews, there's a listing and it's kind of like the all-stars of Christianity. There's some names that you would recognize, there's some names you wouldn't recognize, but they have some common themes. They endured some ridicule and some scorn because of their faith, and yet they endured. Some of them lost their families, and yet they persevered. Some of them would end up losing their lives for the cause of Christ. In that list, it's not a list of people who had it just easy and everything just went their way. It's a list of people who chose to persevere and to see Christ fully as they grew in Christ. Now, you can go back and, and look at that passage and read it and get motivated, but I'm here to tell you, you don't even have to go as far back to the Bible to find some people who've run the race that we can be motivated by. I am sure God has blessed each of you with a parent or a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle or a friend who has run the race of the Christian life that we can get motivated about, that we can be encouraged and challenged by. But not only that, right here in this church, there are heroes of the faith. They're sitting in these chairs. They're walking these halls. And I want to challenge and encourage you, go up to them, talk to them, get to know their story. How do I know that? Because over the past month, some of you have shared your story with me. And they've been stories of perseverance, of overcoming uh, relational issues, health issues, job issues, financial issues. And you've continued to be faithful in your Christian walk. Those stories have motivated me. They've encouraged me. They've challenged me. But the other thing we need to do to take strength from those who've gone on is we need to hang out with other believers, other Christians. In a church of this size, if you only come to the worship, as great as I believe these worship services are, 
the singing and the prayers and, and everything that's involved, you are only going to grow so far. It's not until you get into a small group, a life group, a Bible study, a Sunday school class to really build some relationships, to be encouraged and motivated by one another. So the question that you need to ask yourself is what person of faith and godliness can you spend time with that's going to strengthen your walk? What I want you to do is think about it, pray about it, find that person. And I can guarantee to you, they would be glad to share a part of their story. And not only that, you're going to find they don't have it all figured out, and they probably have some people they lean into, but that's part of what church and Christian community is all about. Secondly, we need to take off anything that trips us up. The passage says it this way, throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. You know, in most sporting events, having excess weight is not a good thing. Unless you're a sumo wrestler, then it's okay. But otherwise, you want to have the least amount of weight. Well, a couple of years ago in the London Marathon, there was a guy by the name of Lloyd Scott who broke a world record for the slowest marathon ever run. He ran it in six days, four hours, 30 minutes, and 56 seconds. He ran it as the starting line, not like everybody else who was in spandex and short shorts and tank tops. He ran the London Marathon in a deep sea scuba diving outfit, complete with the helmet and the face mask on the front. He did it as a fundraiser, as a charity event. But I want you to have that image in your mind because it says we're running a race and some of us as, as Christians are running like that guy. We're weighted down. And that scripture says we're weighted down by one of two things. The first is the sin that so easily entangles. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about sin. We looked at both how sin can affect other people and other people's sin can affect us. And when we read scripture, our eyes get open on some of our shortcomings and things we need to get rid of and cast off. But the second thing that can kind of weigh us down is something that isn't necessarily sinful or morally wrong. It's just something that begins to weigh on us. And perhaps the thing that in this day and time and in this area that I see the most is we get so overcommitted to so many other things. I'm sure we never wake up in the morning and go, hey, today I plan on overscheduling my life to where I have no margins, no room to do anything else. It happens gradually. I mean, most of us in this room, we work and we want to do well in our jobs and we want to be successful. So we give a lot of time and energy to that. If you're married or you're dating somebody, you want to put energy into that and, and be a good partner. And so you're putting a lot of energy into that. If you're a parent, it's kind of the trend right now that to be a good parent, quote, you must have your kid in like 15 different things all at one time and you're racing from this thing to the next thing. And then, of course, you want to be good community people. And so you get involved with your PTA or your homeowners association. Then you want to volunteer at the church. And before you know it, you're pushed to the limits. You're stressed out. Your schedule is overscheduled. And you're hearing all of these voices because your boss wants more and your spouse needs more and your kids need more. And what we can do is shut out the still small voice of God. The one voice that would help us in all those other areas of our life. And so in order to finish well, we need to get really intentional and say, maybe there's something I need to let go of. Not only with the sin of my life, but also some of the other things that are crowding out God. Because many times when we get pushed to the limits, it's God that we go ahead and cut off because the other voices are so loud in our head. The third thing this passage says is we need to choose to persevere. The scripture says, let us run with perseverance this race that God has set before us. You know, down through the ages, success has been seen the ability to move through an obstacle and to persevere. And it's no less different today. But here are some examples of some people you may have heard of that have truly shown persevere within their life. The first is Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire is known as one of America's best dancers, best entertainers. But in his first screenplay, his first trial, 
Here was the quote in the memo about Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire can't act. He's slightly bald and he can only dance a little. Vince Lombardi. If you watch the Super Bowl, you get the Lombardi trophy. Uh, every team has been getting it since the beginning. And Vince Lombardi in Super Bowl one and two brought the Green Bay Packers to win both of those games. A phenomenal football person. Here's what was said about Vince Lombardi early in his career. He possesses minimal football knowledge and he lacks motivation. Walt Disney, have you been to Disney World? I mean, the sky is the frontier, your imagination, whatever you can think of. Did you realize Walt Disney was fired from a newspaper because he had a lack of ideas? And then Albert Einstein, a genius by all accounts. In elementary school, Albert Einstein, his school teacher, had a parent conference with his parents and said, you really should take him out of school. I can't teach him. It's a waste of my time and our resources. Perseverance, choosing now that I will persevere in my Christian faith no matter what happens. When life gets tough, I'm not going to sit on the sidelines. I'll continue to persevere. I saw a great example of kind of perseverance and spiritual momentum a little while back when I was a chaperone for my daughter's field trip to National History Museum. If you've been there, you go through and you see the big elephant and all the other things. And, and I was at the hippopotamus little exhibit. And so I thought, well, I'll read up and study a little bit about hippopotamuses. And here's some things maybe you didn't know. They're the second largest land animal. They can weigh up to 7,000 pounds. And while they're kind of oddly shaped, they kind of got that barrel of a body and these just short stubby legs, they've been clocked running 30 miles per hour, about twice as fast as human beings. Now, on the same side, though, they have horrible eyesight. Their eyesight is only about 30 feet ahead of them. So do you know what happens when they hit something that's 31 feet ahead of them? When you got 7,000 pounds going 30 miles per hour, whatever the obstacle is 31 feet ahead of them, it's going to get blown over, no doubt. You know, you and I are walking this thing of faith. And maybe we only feel like we can see 30 feet ahead of us. And we don't know what the obstacle is 31 feet out. But with spiritual momentum, with perseverance, with the belief that God will bring us through it, we can overcome the obstacles of our life. Because the reality is life is going to get hard at times. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tempting to just check out and sit on the sidelines. And you don't make the decision to persevere when you're in the midst of the trial and the temptation. You make that decision now. I will keep on keeping on. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, God, what do you want me to keep doing? The fourth thing that that passage tells us to do is we need to keep a single-minded focus. The passage says, keep your eyes on Jesus. And of course, that sounds lovely. It sounds spiritual. It sounds nice. And we should definitely do that. But what does that look like? I mean, practically day in and day out. Because like I said, we not only have we overscheduled a lot of our calendars, we've also fully bought into this whole idea of multitasking, that we can do more than one thing at a time. In fact, I was watching the news just recently, and I, I can still remember when you watch the news and it was just one person sitting there and talking. Well, now when you watch the news, you got the person talking, and then underneath you've got this crawler of all the other stories, and then on this side you got stock quotes, and this side sports scores, and at the top the weather. It's just so much stuff, and then they'll do a split screen. All of that stuff right there to try to multitask. And some of us are trying to do that and speed through life. I mean, I have a friend who just recently said he took his instant coffee, put it in the microwave, and thought it still took too long to make. I mean, we just want speed so quickly. I know that one of the first times I really thought multitasking went a little bit too far was about 10, 12 years ago. I was at a hotel, and I'm in my hotel room, and I, I go into the little bathroom that's in that hotel room, and there's a telephone right next to the toilet. And that's where I draw the line on multitasking. I mean, you need single-minded focus when you're in there. That's just crazy. But we have this insatiable need for speed and for more and to pack it all in. 
but we're setting ourselves up for a spiritual struggle and downfall because that type of pace leaves us burned out and tired and worn out. And it's been said, while the spiritual life is a race, you can't gain spiritual intimacy on the run. You've got to find some time to step away and to be in the presence of God because that's what Jesus did. You know, there was always people asking Jesus to do more. Hey, can you heal more? Can you, can you go see this person? Can you come over here? But he had a single-minded focus on what his plan and his purpose was by God. And he set time aside to be with God, to get away. And the reality is we're probably not going to be able to step out of the pace of life we find ourselves in unless you move way, way out and become some hermit. But what we can do is get creative. And so maybe it's taking a walk, going for a jog in your car with the radio off, spending some time in prayer and reflection. For me, when I go for a jog, it is a great spiritual practice because I can just pray and not hear anything else. Or go out on my kayak in the middle of a river or middle of a lake and just spend time with the Lord. Finding times daily to fit it into what you're already doing so you hear the voice of the Lord. Because the question we need to ask ourselves is in order to stay singly minded, focused on Christ, what are you going to do? I will what? And fifth and finally, we need to endure the suffering to see the smile of God. You know, that scripture says it this way, Jesus was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterwards. The writer seems to say Jesus had an eternal perspective. And he kind of puts it there that God is kind of at the finish line and and he's cheering us on. And, And I love that imagery because I can relate to that as a dad. When I go to those track events, I'm at the finish line. I'm there and I'm yelling and I'm screaming for all the kids. But when I see my son turn the corner, I'm yelling and screaming and cheering him on to finish strong. For you and for me, we have a heavenly father. We need to keep this in mind to persevere that is cheering us on. Because some of you, maybe you've got a different view of God, that he's up there kind of a cosmic killjoy that he's trying to see if you're going to trip up and that he's always condemning you. That's not the case. It shows in scripture he did everything he could to show his love for us. And he is at the finish line of life cheering us on. Philippians chapter 3 perhaps says it best when it says this, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us heavenward. Let's pray together. Gracious God, I pray for the individual in here who's thinking about quitting and who needs to persevere. And God, may we look a little bit more like a hippo And may we have an attitude of moving forward and whatever the obstacle is, that you will bring us through it. And then it becomes part of our testimony of not how great we are, but how great you are and what you can do in and through us as we are faithful to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.